Hey everyone, welcome back to another week of Med Geeks. For those of you who celebrate Thanksgiving on the, in the United States, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving and uh, had some fun with your families. Um, today we got another case by Rachel. Um, this is going to be from Jen Surge, right? Ish. Ish. Um, I guess we'll find out. So what do we got? We have a 76-year-old female. She has a history of hyperlipidemia, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. Um, she has a past surgical history of an appendectomy about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago, she had a lysis of adhesions. Mm -hmm. She's here today with diarrhea, fatigue, abdominal discomfort for about two days. Oh, okay. She says she came in today as opposed to two days ago because the diarrhea increased in frequency mm -hmm. and amount. She's had about 12 bowel movements in the past 24 hours, all watery this time. Um, as the day progressed, she became more and more tired, more fatigued. Her abdominal discomfort, she classifies as discomfort as opposed to pain. Okay. Because it wasn't like the pains she's had in the past with her appendicitis or with her small bowel obstructions. It, it was more cramping every time, just a little while before her bowel movements. Mm. Um, of note, she was admitted recently for cholecystitis for which she was treated medically with ceftriaxone. She was sent home on a 14-day course of Vantin, for which she's on day five. Okay. How long ago was this? Her admission? Yeah, for, for close for, for time. A Quote. week prior. A week prior. And when did she start to take, taking antibiotics? On admission. On admission. Yeah. So, so she... if you refer back to our cholecystitis video, uh, one of the treatments is medically managed cholecystitis. Yeah, yeah, so right. she was on ceftriaxone once her symptoms start resolving, once her white count starts normalizing, um, she can then go home on a prolonged course of antibiotics at home okay. until everything kind of yep. calms down. Yep. I and do remember this. Yeah. Come back in electively. Um, yeah, so she was sent home on Vampton. Mm -hmm. So she's on day five. Okay. Um, other than that, she has no fevers, no chills, no nausea, no vomiting. Any cough? No. And everything else in the review system says negative? Negative. Okay. Um, in our ER, her she's a fibrilla, her vital signs are stable. Mm -hmm. her no fevers? No fevers. Okay. Um, her physical exam was essentially benign. You know, she's not in any sort of acute distress, neurologically intact. Uh, respirations are fine, her heart's okay, mm -hmm. her, abdominal, her abdominal exam, she, her belly's soft, non-tender, non-distended. She has well-healed surgical scars. Fairly benign physical exam? Fairly benign, but <sighs> fairly benign physical exam. So what are you thinking so far? Because I mean... So initially, so diarrhea has a whole, bunch, has a whole differential yeah. to begin with. Um, this doesn't seem like anything surgical per se, it seems like a gastroenteritis. Any recent travel, by the way? No. No. no recent travel. Uh, what she was thinking was a couple of days ago she threw up once and mm -hmm. then afterwards she started having all of this diarrhea. She was thinking maybe it was post obstructive, kind of like a previous bowel, small bowel obstruction yeah. that she's had. But other than that, so what we do for her, obviously we do her labs. A uh, couple of significant things her electrolytes were all messed up. She had hypokalemia, hypomagnesia. Magnesemia, mm -hmm. um, likely from her diarrhea episodes. Yep. She's losing yep. all of her weight. And her white count was up to 28. Okay. Yeah. When she was recently discharged, her white count was 12. So and that's after the, the cholecystitis. After the cholecystitis. So, yeah. Okay. So her white count went through the roof within yeah. a couple of days, within yeah. five days. She, um, so with all that information, you know, we sent off a GI PCR panel, stool studies, make sure she hasn't contracted anything. Mm -hmm. She, um, so she, she didn't come from home, which is pertinent. Okay. You know, she came from a senior home, just to be sure that she didn't catch anything another one of the residents had. Interesting. So you know, you, you now see. the picture starts to form a little bit. So you have an old lady. Yeah who's had an infection in the past a week ago, given antibiotics, living in resident homes, coming in with stomach cramping and diarrhea. 
this is looking more like C diff yeah. diarrhea. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So we sent off stool studies, and she came back C diff positive. Okay. So she's diagnosed with C diff. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? We put on contact precautions. Yep, definitely. <laughs> Internal contact precautions, and um, started her on PO vancomycin. Why vancomycin? It's the first line treatment to C diff at the moment. It used to be um, PO vancomycin with PO or IV flagell. Okay. Yeah. Um, but recent studies have shown that flagell actually has no impact or minimal impact. Would it worsen the C diff by any chance? No. No. Okay. So vanco. Or not that I've read. Yeah. Um, so PO vancomycin. Uh, Observe in the hospital, uh, you know, maybe ER stay overnight. Do you send him home? So we admitted her just because of her white count. So there's obviously classifications of C. diff. There's sure. classifications of everything. Um, severe C. diff is a white count over 15,000 mm -hmm. or creatinine bump over 1.5. Um, her creatinine was slightly elevated, but not above 1.5. I believe it was like maybe 1.0.9 or what? Not terribly elevated, um, but her white count was 20. Okay. So as benign as C. diff is, you do have to look out for all the complications that comes with it. Right. And especially in an elderly woman who lives in a resident home who may or may not be getting right. adequately watched. Right. It's easier or it's, it's better for her, for the patient, if we just admit her, wait until she has more formed bowel movements so we can take her off of contact precautions Got and it. then send her home with PO. So let's talk about that. You kind of touched on it. What are the risk factors for C. diff and what risk factors did this lady have? So what's the one antibiotic we hear about in PA school on our boards? The one pimp question you get, whether you're on medicine or surgery or ER or wherever, what antibiotic gives you C. diff? Clindamycin. Clindamycin. Yeah, so that's the textbook drilled into us. But with clindamycin, fluoroquinolones can give you C. diff. Ampicillin and amoxicillin can give you C. diff and third generation cephalosporin. Correct. So while in our heads we're thinking, oh, you know what? She only had second, a uh, first, and, uh, while in our heads we're thinking, oh, she only had cephalosporins, not clindamycin, it's important to keep in mind that just about any antibiotic can cause C. diff. Correct, yeah. But now that now fluoroquinolones, penicillins, cephalosporins are becoming more prevalent in causing C. diff. Mm. Along with just being given an antibiotic, many people are carriers of C. diff. I'm sure you, I, and many of our viewers are carriers of C. diff. Comes with a job. Yeah, I step in the walls of a hospital. You yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't even have to do anything. Um, but approximately 20% of adults, especially those that are in long-stay units, are carriers of C. diff. So then for being in a resident home. What makes a difference between me and her, then, if we're both C. diff carriers? She was given antibiotics. Is there anything else? So she stays in an adult care yeah. center. Yeah. So there's that. Whether she got it from another one of the residents there or not, obviously we don't know. Yeah. It is very... It sheds spores. C. diff sheds spores mm -hmm. a lot, which is why we're, everyone's in contact everyone's now. Everyone's contact to it, yeah. If another one of the residents was had C. diff or was developing C. diff and they didn't know. You just don't know. You're not in contact. Mm -hmm. It could spread. That with her being on antibiotics. So the pathophysiology of uh, Clostridium difficile mm -hmm. infection. Uh, antibiotics do disrupt the colonic gut flora. Yep. Once that's disrupted, it gives a rise to Clostridium difficile mm -hmm. and has you prone to developing the infection. Yep. Yep. Um... And let's talk about signs and symptoms of uh, C. diff and how to diagnose it. Yeah. Luckily, signs and symptoms are very iconic mm -hmm. of C. diff. Yep. Watery, very foul-smelling diarrhea. Smell from down the hallway. Smell <laughs> from down the hallway. Yep. It's either that or you smell the bioillumination mm -hmm. spray from yep. down the hallway. Yep. Um, yeah. You can have some mild abdominal discomfort, pain, cramping. All in all, just from diarrhea, that's not specific to C. diff. You can also have a mild gastroenteritis. This is true. Um, dehydration, if you haven't mm -hmm. kept up with your PO intake, mm -hmm. like our lovely woman. Um, 
Do you frequently have fevers and chills? No. Very okay. limited. Okay. So, so you have this lady coming in with diarrhea. You're suspecting C. diff because she took antibiotics. Stool culture is the only way to diagnose? So there's a couple ways. You can do the stool assay studies. What's much quicker and more available now is a stool PCR study, mm -hmm. which gets you results back as quick as two hours to 24 hours, depending on how busy the lab is. How long does stool culture take? So the school. The assay. The stool assay? Yeah. And it can take up to 48 hours. Okay. So the PCR is significantly quicker. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is more expensive. Convenience. But convenience and, I mean, I, yeah, oh. You can also get imaging, you can get an abdominal x-ray or CT scan if you're worried about severe disease or a complication of C. diff, which would be toxic megacolon. Yeah, exactly. So the complications are fulminant sepsis, toxic megacolon, colonic perforation. Mm -hmm. Very serious complications. C. diff isn't just a normal gastroenteritis bug no. that you can throw antibiotics at and say, okay, see you later. Um, patients are at risk of developing complications bad enough to need surgery especially in the elderly patients like this that can't fully express themselves or experience pain differently mm -hmm. you'd want to keep a closer eye on um, toxic megacolon is one of the more common complications we see just because fulminant sepsis when patients develop it are referred to medicine and the medical icu Got it. with toxic megacolon or chronic perforation is when surgery is consulted a toxic megacolon are worried about when they, you have a transverse colon or a sequel diameter greater than 10 centimeters. Okay. Once you hit 10 centimeters and the patient has pain and they have a concerning abdominal exam, mm -hmm. it's equivalent to a colonic perforation, whether it is perfed or not. Interesting. Your colon can't really dilate so much more than that and sustain it. Mm -hmm. The surgery is quite invasive and quite life-altering. So it's important to catch these patients early and treat them. Get GI on board if just simple oral uh, mycomycin isn't working. See what they have up there in like in their arsenal to yep. help. But if it comes down to it and the patient needs surgical intervention, they get a subtotal colectomy with an end ileostomy. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it's a mouthful. So you're losing your colon and you're getting the terminal ileum brought up to your skin. And you had now have an ostomy appliance, yeah. Yeah. which is again difficult to deal with whether you're in your 40s because it's life altering, or whether you're in your 70s and 80s because Regardless, you need fine motor skills. Your, the quality of life is uh, diminished quite a bit. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, okay, and so let's talk about treatment. Okay, um, treatment is oral vancomycin. Like we said, you can do one 25 to 500 milligrams mm -hmm. every six hours. Okay, for 10 to 14 days depending on the severity of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, for reoccurrences, you can essentially start there and then work your way up. You can do rifaximin, four, <laughs> rifaximin 400 uh, milligrams PLBID for 14 days. There's also a human monoclonal antibody you can mm -hmm. give to prevent mm -hmm. recurrences if it happens so often. A rather new treatment that's coming out is a fecal transplant. Cool. Right? What rounds? <laughs> you take about two to 300 um, milliliters of donor feces, mm -hmm. and it's administered via nasojejunal tube uh -huh. or as an enema. Wow. The That's pretty process, cool, actually. Yeah. And the thought process is? The thought process is that you're resetting the gut flora with... The new fecal matter. The new fecal matter. I'm Makes sure sense. Right. Seems primitive, yet so innovative. <laughs> Seems a little gross. <laughs> well, yeah, but if it works, it works. Yeah. Um, I'm sure our GI colleagues know a lot more about it. Yeah, yeah. And I would love to hear more about it. Yeah, so definitely comment below because we, uh, we would love to know. I think it's um, fascinating. Yeah. Um, so quick question, like, yeah. if a patient like this, you know, comes to me in primary care or urgent care, what is our threshold to send them to the ER versus treat them with PO antibiotics at home? I would send everybody to the ER just because you need to be on contact precautions, at least until you have formed bowel movements. Mm -hmm. Whether that means that they get a short stay with medicine, whether they just get 
observed in the ER. But just so that way they're not out in the world spreading it to Joe Schmo on the street. Right. Or you don't know what their house, what their family lives are, even if they have an infant or mm-hmm. an elderly grandfather at home. Plus complication rates, or not rates, rather, the complications are rather serious. So you want to make sure you're not you know, at yeah. risk of any of those complications. If you have a concerning abdominal exam, definitely send it to the ER. Okay. If this is a patient who has recurrences every so often, definitely send them to the ER. All right. Okay. So regardless, send them to the ER. (laughs) Send them to the ER. Understood. Okay, guys. uh, That is the case for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, You know, we want to hear your feedback. So if you have any questions, any concerns, any anything, just comment below uh, and make sure to subscribe so you can follow us along every single week. That will be it for today, guys. I hope to see you next week. We hope to see you next week, um, and uh, we'll catch you then. All right, bye.